Hello, welcome to worship for uh, the weekend of March 29th here at St. Peter's Highland United Church of Christ, where whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we welcome you into this time of virtual worship this morning. Uh, We hope that uh, it finds you well. We're glad to see you virtually. We hope that you're glad to see us. And we hope that you will find this time of worship to be engaging and uh, fulfilling and inspiring. So sit back and uh, prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we hear the playing of today's prelude. There's a path, though it winds its way through darkness, we would choose to avoid it if we could. We awake to an unexpected calling, God says, come, there are gifts in the dark. The gift of temptation may bring with it images of resisting things of evil, images that sometimes might take on a seriously dangerous form, or images that are as seemingly benign as the pastry on the plate in front of you. But instead of talking about those sorts of temptations, the temptation for this week is actually the temptation to do the things that we think we should be doing rather than following the path that our spirit suggests is right for us. The path that would bring us the best of our energy and joy to the world. Our Lenten journey invites us to face the temptations 
that erode our fullness and steal us away from our wholeheartedness. There's a path, path. though it winds its way through darkness, we would choose choose. to avoid it if we could. We awake awake. to an unexpected calling, God says come, come. there are gifts in the dark woods. Let us pray. Unexpected love, enter our lives and open us to the gifts residing deep within the holy darkness of our lives. Open us to seek your voice from deep within, for we yearn to feel you moving in us. In your many names we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to join us uh, at home in the litany of confession, assurance, and peace. Uh, It's displayed on your monitor. For paying more attention to to the expected path than the right one. Forgive and restore us, O God. For denying our very aliveness out of a misguided, self sacrificing agenda. Forgive and restore us, O God. For valuing the safe choices instead of the ones that lead to life. Forgive and restore us, O God. Friends, hear these words of assurance. God desires our fully alive selves. God is cheering us on when we discern our best choices. God is with you, forgiving and restoring you to wholeheartedness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, it's time now for our children's moment. And so if you have uh, children with you, or even if, even if you don't, I invite you to uh, 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 be part of this moment. And as we do so, as we have been during our series of uh, of Darkwood's uh, Children's Moments, we are going to be uh, getting ready for our journey together by using our readiness prayer. And so if you recall, uh, I will say a line and you'll repeat after me. And uh, we have some uh, hand motions uh, and body motions that go along with that. So let's do our readiness prayer. Our eyes are ready to see your face. Our ears are ready to hear your call. Our feet are ready to walk your path. Our hands are ready to share your peace. Our hearts are ready to share your love. Our minds are ready to know your grace. Amen. So I want to start out today by asking a question. Has anyone ever asked you what you want to be when you grow up? I would imagine a lot of yeses came back from that question. And I used to uh, ask kids this question all the time, but I don't really ask that question anymore because since when do you have to be a grown-up in order to be a somebody? You're somebody right now, and I want you to remember that. Dreaming about our future can be a lot of fun. It can be a lot of fun to think about all the different uh, jobs we might want to have uh, when we're older. But we also need something to help us when we're tempted to spend all of our time thinking about that future. So I want you to consider another question. And that question is, who am I? Let's say it together. 
Ready? Who am I? Well, no matter what we want to be or what we want to do when we grow up, God has a special call for all of us to, oursel- to be ourselves, to be our best selves, right now, all the time. And so I want each of you to think about one thing that truly makes you special. One thing that makes you, you. Something that you like to do, something that you're able to do, a talent that you might have, a way that you uh, connect with other people. What is that thing that makes you, you? I thank you for sharing those things, and I agree, all of you are very special and unique people, and I'm glad to have you with me on this journey. Thank you for sharing about how unique each one of you are. So we've been thinking about what we can do and what we're meant to do. Those things that make us unique are the the gifts that God gives us to use to be our fullest selves. So no matter what you end up doing when you find yourself grown up, remember who you are. You are a child of God. Your best self is good enough for God. It's good enough for the world. And I hope that it is good enough for you. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from Luke 4, verses 1 through 13. And it reads this way. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all their authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please to. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil finished, had finished every test, they departed from him until the opportune time. For how many of you was this scripture passage at least somewhat familiar? It's a story that's also included in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew. And it's the story of what happens to Jesus at the end of his 40-day period of solitude in the wilderness following his baptism. That period of time and of self-examination and inquiry is at least partially the model of what would become the liturgical season of Lent. 40 days of discernment. 40 days of self-examination. In more modern terminology, we might say that Jesus was spending this time finding himself. Well, when I selected this particular worship series for Lent several months ago, I had not intended for all of us to be enduring a different sort of 40 days in the wilderness, this time of social distancing and isolation in which we find ourselves. And I suspect that some of us 
at least are finding ourselves over these weeks, or at least finding out an awful lot about ourselves and those with whom we live. That idea of finding ourselves works well with this year's theme of gifts of the dark wood. For the last several Sundays, we've been talking about how we, how we cope when we find ourselves in those dark wood places in our lives. These areas of loss and hurt and emptiness that come for all of us. And while those times are not always pleasant places to be, they often provide a space for some of our most important spiritual growth to take place. <clears throat> this week, we're talking about the gift of temptation. Now, you might be wondering how exactly a temptation can be a gift. After all, on a quick read of the passage from Luke that Dick shared a moment ago, we could probably easily conclude that temptation is usually not a good thing at all, right? Add to that the fact that each time we say the Lord's Prayer, that we ask God to lead us not into temptation. And it would be easy to believe that there's not any sense in which temptation is a good thing, let alone that it's some sort of spiritual gift. But I want to think about that a little bit today. And while it's true that temptations can lead us into sinful behavior, the temptation itself is not anything that's of our own doing. Temptation finds all of us, whether we are looking for it or not. It's how we respond to temptation that reveals our focus and discipline as disciples of Jesus Christ. So let's think about the temptations in our own lives. As I said earlier, we, we usually think of temptation as being a bad thing, something that should be avoided, something that, that leads us along the path to sinful behavior. And temptations can certainly do that. But what I want to talk about this morning is one of the most dangerous temptations, a temptation that can derail us from the path that God called us to and cause pain and frustration in our lives. Surprisingly, it's not the temptation that you might be thinking of. It's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's not even envy or, glee or, or, or greed or gluttony. What I am speaking of today is the temptation to do good. Yes, you heard me right. The temptation to do good. Now, hear me out on this. Think about the last time you were tempted to do something really sinister or evil. I'm talking about something really bad, like throwing your boss out the window after you were turned down for a promotion kind of bad. Yet, if you haven't actually thrown your boss out the window lately or done more than entertain brief fantasies of such sort of behavior, then doing really great evil is probably not a significant temptation for you. So if we can exclude evil actions as a serious temptation, chances are that the temptations that we often fall prey to are those temptations to do good. And while there's nothing wrong with doing good things, it's when we're tempted to do someone else's good that we find ourselves falling into trouble. You see, each one of us is uniquely called by God to service in our own unique sorts of ways. We've talked about call a few times over the last several weeks, and and we've talked about how answering God's call is not just achieved by entering into professional ministry, but that God calls each of us, perhaps to be parents, maybe to be teachers or nurses or mentors or friends or volunteers or advocates for others. And the list goes on and on and on. And living into those calls is a good thing. The problem comes when we're tempted to do the good that someone else has been called to do. 
in his companion book to this series, Gifts of the Dark Wood, Eric Elms tells the story of a poet named David White who went to work for a non-profit environmental advocacy group. Now, White shared many of the same core beliefs of this organization, and he believed in their mission and was passionate about it. But after a couple of years on the job, he found that he was restless with his work, and he found that he had no passion for what he was doing. The problem was that White had given up the very thing he was called to do, writing poetry. And he gave it up because he thought he could do good things through the advocacy group. And he did do good work. It just turns out it wasn't his work to do. He gave up the job, he gave up the steady paycheck, and he returned to writing. He reconnected with his passions and began to fully live into the life that God had called him to live. This whole thing about avoiding the temptation to do good might still be a bit paradoxical until we remind ourselves that Jesus was faced with that same sort of temptation himself. But I want to ask, for all of you that have heard this gospel story multiple times, have you ever stopped to think about what exactly it was that Jesus was being tempted with and why he didn't give in to those temptations? What I'm getting at here is that the devil, or the adversary, or the Satan, depending on which translation of the Bible you're reading, what I'm getting at is that Jesus' tempter doesn't tempt Jesus with anything evil, or bad, or destructive. But instead, Jesus is tempted in this story to do good. Think about the temptations. First, the adversary tells Jesus to turn stones into bread. Now, the initial indication is that this is to help assuage his own hunger from having been in the wilderness for 40 days. But with the power to turn stones into bread, Jesus would recognize a power that would allow him to not just feed himself, but to feed all of those who were hungry and without food. What an important and powerful ministry. But that wasn't what Jesus was called to do. And so he resists that great temptation to do good. Next, the devil offers Jesus the power over all of the world if Jesus would just worship him. Jesus has the chance to have all of the worldly power that he could possibly imagine. Think about what Jesus could have accomplished if he was all-powerful in that way. He could have changed laws and governments, changes that would have resulted in positive results and outcomes for hundreds of thousands or millions of people. But it was not what Jesus was called to do. And so he resists that temptation to do good. Finally, the adversary calls Jesus to throw himself down from the temple, knowing that the angels would save him. What's to gain here for Jesus anyway? This would have been a very public miracle, one that would have brought Jesus instant recognition and fame and prestige and respect. It would have likely made things easier for him during his ministry on earth. It would have meant even larger groups, even larger uh, audiences and groups of followers. It might have meant that more people would have heard the saving words of his teachings. No longer would faith be necessary. The miracle would provide the certainty required. But this was not what Jesus was called to do. And so he resists that great temptation to do good. As Elms notes in his book, the point is that none of these activities would harm anyone. Not initially, anyway. And Jesus does feed the hungry. He does change the political equation. And he does perform miracles at various points in his ministry. Yet none of these individual activities were ones that Jesus was called to devote all of his time and energy to. Jesus' purpose and true power was not realized through feeding the hungry 
or practicing politics or performing miracles, even as each of these surely was part of his path. Devoting his entire life's work to them was too small of a calling for Jesus. God called him to something much higher. In light of this way of thinking about temptation, perhaps the question of salvation is not, are you saved? But rather, are you used? In other words, have you given yourself over to the Spirit in such a way that you're willing to allow it to lead you on your path and to bring you to the fullness of your life? Many people never allow themselves the joy of following their best path because they think that it would be too enjoyable and is therefore selfish. We tend to think that it's more godly and self-sacrificing to follow a path that may not be central to our deepest spiritual yearnings. When we do that, we never consider that God has placed these yearnings within us for a reason. We may not know or fully understand that reason, but we can rest assured that God does. I believe that God has called all of us to be agents of goodness and love in this world, to work together to bring about the kingdom of God here on earth. But each of our calls is different and unique. When we're in the dark wood places of our lives, we will be tempted to do as much good as we can in order to emerge from those woods as a productive disciple. But when we fall into the temptation to do the good that we are not called to do, we don't find freedom, just further restlessness and discontent. Friends, find the good that you are called to do. You may have already found it. And live into that call with all of your passion and all of your energy and all of your love and all of your grace. There, you will find a wholehearted way of living that will make your spirit soar and your heart sing. And you will become a beacon for others who are struggling to emerge from those same dark woods. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer today, I want to remind those that are uh, live with us this morning that if you stay on after the end of our time of worship, that we will have a chance to share prayer concerns with one another. And so I invite you to hold those concerns until that time. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits now for a time of prayer. Come and rest, come and listen, lay the fullness of your lives before the Maker. Come and rest, come and listen, lay the fullness of your lives before the Maker. God, there are so many things to pray for this week, and there are so many people who are walking the dark woods for various reasons. Hear us now as we offer these prayers to you in this time of quiet and meditation. Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Oh God, we face temptation all the time. The temptation to do good and bad, 
the temptation to do those things to ourselves and others, the temptation to live a life other than the one you have called us to live. Often we are afraid or uncertain about the path that we should take. We try to trust our own logic or judgment rather than placing our trust in you and allow ourselves to be guided by our faith. Today we turn our lives over to you. Guide us out of these dark woods and into the light of the joy of living into your call for us. Affirm our calls. Nudge us towards changes in our lives and grant us a sense of peace as we surrender ourselves to your will. Today we especially pray for all of us and all of the different ways that our lives have been impacted by this pandemic. We pray for our leaders, that they might make the right decisions. We pray for the doctors, nurses, and first responders that are on the front line, coming face to face with this dangerous illness. We pray for those who are infected and those they love. And we pray for all of those whose lives have been upended by the many ways that this outbreak has brought loss into our lives. As we pray for those whom we love and care about this day, we are reminded of your constant and abiding presence with us and with those who also inhabit these dark woods. For all of our prayers this day, we ask your blessing and mercy. And we ask this and all things in the name of the one who leads us through the uncertain times in our lives, Jesus the Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come and rest. Come and rest. Come and listen. Come and listen. Lay the fullness of your lives before the Maker. Lay your fullness of your lives before the Maker. Come and rest. Come and rest. Come and listen. Come and listen. Lay the fullness of your lives before the Maker. Lay the fullness of your lives before the Maker. If you joined us for worship last week, you know that while we are not able to gather together in person to pass the plate, that we're still going to have a time to offer our tithes and offerings as part of this time of worship. And I will remind you that this act of worship is just as important as any of the others that we've included here today. If you're watching this video, then the ministry of this church is important to you. Don't forget to continue to give of those offerings. Let me say a couple of quick things about how you can do this. But first of all, a reminder. If your job or your source of income has been disrupted by this uh, coronavirus shutdown, take care of yourself and your family first. We would never ask for any money that you don't have. But if you are able to give, then we need you to continue to give. And we've tried to make it as easy as possible under these circumstances. Under this video link, you will find uh, a link to our online giving portal. 
you can also access that online giving link through um, the post that is at the top of our church Facebook page. And earlier this week, you should have received another letter uh, from the church that included in it uh, an additional pre-addressed offering envelope uh, that you can mail your offerings into the church. Either way, we will receive that offering and we will be grateful for it. A big word of thanks to those of you who have already responded. I know we've been receiving lots of envelopes in the mail over this last week and a number of donations online as well. Your generosity and continued support is truly appreciated. Thank you for that. So now um, we want to take a moment and give you a second to stop what you're doing at home and to take a quick moment to go online and make that donation uh, or to go ahead and fill out that check and drop it in that envelope and get it ready to drop in the mail tomorrow. Go ahead. Don't worry about us. We're happy to wait for you. Friends, it has been a joy to be in worship with you today. And as we part ways for another week, I invite you to hear these words of blessing. You have a place in this world, a place where everything comes together in your body and you disappear into a seamless wholeness. Find your call and inhabit this world with your fullest self. I invite you to join in speaking the words in bold on your screen when we get to them. May the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully within life's dark wood, go, go before, before you, you to show you the way, go, go above, above you, you to watch over you, go behind, behind you to push you into places you may not necessarily go yourself. Go beneath, Go beneath you, you to uphold and uplift you. Go, Go beside, beside you to be your strong and constant companion. And dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone and that you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessings burn brightly upon you and within you now and always. Amen. Amen. There's a path, There's a path. and it leads us out together to the wood. To the wood. Where the darkness hovers still, we are sent. We are sent. And the Spirit goes before us. God says, Go. God says, Go. Be my presence in the world. Peace be with you, friends. We'll see you next time.